<laughs> we got it. We got it. We got it. Um, not a millennial, but muddling through here on the tech. Neither am I. Same thing. So we're in the boat. We were in the same boat together. Um, well, thank you for agreeing to come through and and chat with me and and us. No, well, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm hanging in there. I just found out that the smoothie I made to get me through this whole thing is completely frozen. So oh man! I thought it would <laughs> hold in the freezer. I didn't realize it would freeze so fast. Um, how are you doing? I'm doing good. You know, we fighting the good fight. Um, doing what we have to do. Um, so I, I'm excited about that. Uh, I guess first, actually, let me lift up uh, Breonna Taylor, uh, Ahmaud Aubrey, uh, George Floyd, Rashard, and I want to lift up um, Toyin, who was a young activist uh, in Tallahassee, Florida, who was killed. And I want to lift up um, a friend of ours at, at the Hip Hop um, who passed away about uh, 10 days ago named Jazz Flash. She was an amazing writer for This Is Us. And so I kind of wanted to lead with that because I just wanted to actually make sure that if anybody out there, this time it feels very hard with COVID and what's going on in our communities. And if you have any kind of issues going on, please do not hesitate to call the uh, Suicide Prevention Line at one 800 Two seven three eight two five five. That's one eight hundred two seven three eight two five five. Because a lot of us out here who are doing this work um, need to make sure that we show love, and we don't. Sometimes we don't show love for ourselves the way that we need to. So I just want to leave with that because yes, Black Lives Matters, but you matter as well. Your spirit matters. Your emotions matter. Your work matters. Everything about you, if you're watching, matters. So I just want to make sure and make sure that for all those who are fighting a good fight, take care of themselves because self-care is a revolutionary act. It is indeed. Um, Thank you for grounding us in that before we launch into who knows what here, I may ask you. No, definitely. So you are founder and president of Hip Hop Caucus. Yeah. For those who are not familiar, tell us about it. What is the work that you do? Yeah, Hip Hop Caucus started, uh, will be 16 years this year. Uh, We were most known in the beginning um, for doing our voting work. So we started first with Vote or Die, and now we have the campaign called Respect My Vote. Mm -hmm. And so for those watching, it takes two minutes. And if you have registered to vote, go to respectmyvote.com right now, register to vote. But it's the longest running hip hop campaign ever. Um, And so that's exciting. We've done that. And then I'm originally from Louisiana. So when Hurricane Katrina hit, uh, we began to get more engaged in that work as well regarding environmental justice and climate justice. Um, And I think for many of us, uh, they kind of wanted to silo the Hip Hop Caucus and said, okay, it's another primarily black organization doing this work. So you just do environmental justice work. And we're like, no, we don't, we, we, first of all, we're not just all black. We're black, white, brown, red, male, female, gay. Oh no. Is this mine spinning or his? <laughs> I lost you. No, I'm, I'm here. I uh, know. Uh, uh, Mom was calling me. I'm actually, so I'm, I'm actually tonight, I'm in two places at the same time. So I'm actually right now pre tape at the Pe- Poor People's Campaign, and I'm here live. So she's probably, Mom is probably freaking out. Like, how are you, how are you doing that? How are you like, on Instagram with Ayana and like you're with Reverend Barber at the same time. So, <laughs> but, but we, but we, but we did that work around, around Katrina. So then this year marks the 50th anniversary of Hurricane Katrina. So 
for people to find out more about Hip Hop Caucus, you guys are on social um, and and have been organizing for a long time. And um, what is, um, how can people support your work? Well, I mean, we do, so first and foremost, we, we do our work around electoral. They can go to respectmyvote.com. We do our work around uh, civil and human rights work and so we do that. We work around issues with COVID, obviously defund the police, other work around issues regarding police brutality, and just overall, how do we dismantle white supremacy and institutional racism? And so, and we do that throughout the country. So you can go to hiphopcaucus.org to do that. And then we do or do our climate work um, through our platform called Think 100 Climate. And we would love folks to go there as well, where we do work around we do things with podcasts, we do uh, movies. Actually, we have a movie coming out uh, next year called Age of Elvis Heat Wave. Uh, super, yes, super exciting. Actually, it will be executive produced by Dream Hampton. So really, 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 really uh, excited about, about that and uh, the work. Um, it's a climate comedy documentary. So it's super exciting from that standpoint. But it's, it actually, they, they'll say it's much more. So let me just say it's much more than much more than that. But it's coming out next year, uh, tw- 2021. Uh, but you can find out all about that work at think100climate.com. And, they, and you've got a podcast that's running now. People don't have to wait for that. The movie, you have to wait for the podcast. You can have that. Yes. Yeah, the, way, the podcast actually is actually on it. It's funny because the podcast is actually dynamic because We've had guests on, on there, um, such as Dr. Beverly Wright, um, Dr. Richard McLean, um, Dr. Adrian Hollis, Tamika Mallory, Emerald Garner, and so many more. And I think it's very powerful because as they have been discussing, one thing, you are fantastic because as you know, uh, you are just a, just a leader in this movement and you've done so much work. And I heard earlier, about your, you know, people talk about your article in the Washington Post, but just in, it didn't start there obviously for you. You've been fighting this good fight about how we connect the dots between racial justice and climate justice for quite some time. But having this platform with uh, on Climate Friday, which is a part of the podcast, the, the coolest show, mm-hmm. is it's been this exciting because we've been having so many phenomenal conversations with particularly women of color um, who are in this field. And so many people think of our movement and climate and the oceans and the wildlife as being predominantly white. I say Birkenstock, um, but it's so much more. It's so much more than that. And so it's really exciting to have this platform to really lift up the voices of these amazing uh, people doing this critical work to literally figure out how we can fight both climate justice and racial justice at the same time. So um, one of the um, things that I shared on Julia's Instagram, one of the last posts was about this, um, the polling data on who is the most concerned about climate. And yeah. like you were saying, like that we have this perception of the of environmentalists as like the Birkenstocks crew, uh, <laughs> yeah. um, sort of, you know, often think of them as like more well off and it being a privilege to be a part of something like that. Um, and so I was actually really surprised when I first saw, I think just last year, um, the Yale um, Center on Climate Change Communication and George Mason University have been doing this polling for a decade, um, yep. asking people about their perceptions of climate change. And um, they've been breaking that down by demographics and they released data just a few months ago showing how that breaks down by race. And it's um, 49% of white people are concerned about climate change, 57% of black people are concerned about climate change, and 70% of Latinx people are com- concerned about climate change. And so that really sort of upends this stereotype that white people care more about the environment than people of color. And- No, it does. I find that really interesting because people have hated that I bring that up and I bring mm. it's important to bust the myth and they're like, bringing it up is really divisive. We're all in this together. Um, and I'm like, yeah, we're, we're all in this together, but why should we not 
um, sort of propel forward with the people who already care, right? But That's right. We have all these people who already care. We have um, on the climate denial end, it's like twice as likely that you'll be um, a climate denier if you're white than if you're a person of color. Um, so let's just take the people who already get it and like charge ahead together. Um, That's, well, you know, I mean, what you're making, you're making a point that there's a lot of different reasons why there's a disconnect, right? In, in over the years, and we should get into that. But the reality is that 68% of people of color, particularly black people, live within 30 miles of a coal fire power plant. And so we're literally right next to the pollution that's causing asthma and emphysema and cancer. And if you go further, the connection there, for instance, you're in New York. Um, I used to live in New York um, and obviously still, still connect there. But Eric Garner, for instance, is a good example of that, that, that connection between racial justice and climate justice. Because in Eric Garner, obviously, we all saw him being choked to death in this illegal chokehold by the police department. But what people don't know is that in the Staten Island, where he's from, where they, while they have the most trees than any other borough in New York City, they receive the F for air quality um, from the American Lung uh, 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 Center and campaign. And in that process, what we see is that Eric Garner had asthma. But on top of that, almost everyone in Eric Garner's family also has asthma. And so while he was physically choked, the systems of racism that was causing the police brutality is also causing the pollution. And so we saw this play out. And you know, I wear a lot of hats. This happened here since Flint still doesn't have clean water, which they don't. But I had a hat that said Eric Garner. And one of the saddest things for me, Ayanna, was this, is that um, Erica Garner, who was fighting for her father, had an asthma-induced heart attack at 27. And so that I had to get another hat, it said Erica Garner. Because then you a situation where not only was the father being killed, but then she was being killed, which becomes genocide. And then you now have the children of, em of, of Erica and Eric Garner, the grandchildren and, the, and the, the kids of Eric Garner, who now have asthma as well. So even though they're not being killed by police brutality on the streets, or they're not saying, I can't breathe, either like Eric Garner or George Floyd, they're still saying, I can't breathe because they're being killed by the pollution in their communities. And so it makes sense for us to be the ones to be say that we're sick and tired of being sick and tired and we got to stand up to, to, to fight for the climate justice and fight against the environmental hazards in our community. And that's why I'm not surprised by that, both in black and brown and red communities, because we're the ones who they don't, again, back to the Black Lives Matter, they don't think our communities matter. They think that our communities are sacrifice zones. They can just do anything they want to do. And so we have to stand up to poverty and brutality and pollution at the same time. I think this has been a moment where people are, people's eyes are being opened to a lot of things that have been around, but they haven't seen where it's That's right, yeah. reckoning, right? As, as America um, is being forced to face racial violence and mm -hmm. brutality um, and white supremacy and figure out like, are we going to end it? Yes or no, are we going to, make a better way and for me this moment has been one of connecting the dots as you know like that's what i've been trying to do in my writing is help people connect the dots and on climate and covid and um racial justice it's it does feel like maybe that message is breaking through that people of color living near power plants bad air already weakened respiratory systems get covid worse um and of course like the mm -hmm. health and climate and then just have like our more often essential workers so are more exposed and so we have and you know black businesses aren't getting the stimulus bailout funds and so there's the economic crisis and all these things are mashing up together and do you feel like as someone who's been working on telling this story 
for a long time and trying to break through. Do you feel like this intersection of crises is actually helping people understand that? Do you feel like doors are opening to the message that you're trying to convey? I, I do feel. I think it's it's one we're beginning to break down the silos for for too long. We've been operating in these silos um, where it's been immigration here, gay rights here, uh, women for black lives here, women's rights here, and we've been operating in these silos. And so, unfortunately, that we're not looking for a pandemic and pollution and brutality um, and all these things at the same time. But it is that is forcing us to break down these silos. But on top of that, I do think that what's also happening is that you have particularly white people in situations who are moving um, from just being white allies to being a white accomplice, where they're literally saying that, you know, I am going to get in the way. I am going to put my body in the gear of the machine along with you. I'm not gonna keep seeing black and red and 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 and, and and brown lives being literally grinded up in the machine, I'm going to put my body in there as well. And that's so powerful. And I think that if that can continue on not just the, the level on the streets, but also in the suites, so we can begin to see resources and infrastructure and, and those things also passing along and people feeling that pinch, so to speak. Um, I think that this could be a moment, this, this, this has to be a moment to be honest, Ayana, because our parents, you know, they fought for equality in the 20th century. But now we are now fighting not only for equality, but we're now fighting for existence in the 21st century. And so the stakes are much higher. The IPCC report says, listen, we have about 10 years before the die is cast on climate change and we have other things happening. And listen, we just can't even just, we, we gotta just fix it together so we can live together as humans. And so this moment is literally a moment where we either work together and succeed or we perish as fools and succumb. This is that moment we're living in right now. I think about that a lot because I think about how to address the climate crisis, we just need the biggest possible team. And Most definitely. Make sure that we're welcoming people in, helping everyone find a home for themselves in this work. Um, and um, I'm so glad you're doing what you're doing. <laughs> and likewise, likewise. So Ed, you're doing what you're doing as well. So I have uh, two last quick questions. What, okay, okay. How can, we, uh, how can we support your work? Did I already ask you this? You did, but they can go to hiphopcaucus.org and they can vote. Make sure to vote. Respectmyvote.com. Please, two minutes. Get out the vote. Um, okay, so last question. Um, I thought 20 minutes would be like so much time, but it's like zero. Um, I have so many more questions for you, but I'll just ask you um, if racism didn't exist, what would you be doing with your time? Oh man, it's actually kind of easy. I would be enjoying so much more time with my beautiful two boys, River and King. Um, I feel like racism has taken time away from me being a father, the kind of father but about being an activist. And if I could just go out to see River play hockey or go out and see King do his computer games, I would spend so much more time doing that. But because of racism, it has taken time for my children because I love humanity so much. But that is, without a doubt, I would spend more time with my boys uh, on a much deeper and longer level. Well, um, everyone listening, please go fix racism so Revan Yearwood can hang out with his family. Um, yes, it's about Father's Day too. So I definitely, come on, give me some more time. Father's Day. <laughs> okay, um, we have next to someone who's gonna connect the dots a step, uh, a step further into the health arena. It's Dr. Rob Gore, who's an ER um, physician here in New York City. So he's seeing a lot of this same stuff. So we'll carry it on. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you, my sister. Take care. Bye-bye. All power to the people. <laughs>